Welcome to my fireside, everybody. Thanks for coming. I've been waiting a long time to do this, I guess. I mean, I always knew this would happen, and now it's going to happen. Welcome to the Accelerando Counter Concert. I'm counting on this being good. Let me set the scene. It's February 20th, 2020. And it's two or three in the afternoon. I'm in Wedgwood, Houston at a recording studio. And I'm on break. And a friend of mine pulls me aside and she says, you know, I heard that Titus and Emilio have been spreading around the orchestra that you've been driving around their houses and they're about to file an HR complaint against you. And I said, you gotta be kidding me. You know that's bullshit, right? And she goes, I know, but I don't think they think it's bullshit. So that's where I said enough of this. I don't know what this is anymore. If that's what's going down, we need some professional help. So I started texting everybody from management from the session. I said, you know what? I would like to speak about this tonight. I would like to have a sit down because some people are possessed of something evil and it ain't me. Which fell on many sets of deaf ears the director of orchestra operations, the maestro. Nobody seemed to give a shit about any of this. So I finished the session about five o'clock. I was going to go home for dinner, but I didn't. I went straight to the skirmahorn and I went into Giancarlo's office and I let him have it. I laid it out there. I was like, you need to be the boss. This is on you. Sit your musicians down and fix this fucking problem. I was screaming. Maniacally. Because I had had enough. And I didn't want to go down like this. You know? I, um... I just didn't want to go down over nothing. And I didn't want the orchestra to be destroyed. So I let the maestro have it. I said, you know, after this concert, let's do it. Let's do it tonight. It's all Beethoven concert. We were playing Leonore Overture. Then I think the first piano concerto. And then the Eroica Symphony. So after I got out of the office, I was heated up. I knew the witch hunt was on. And I don't use witch hunt as a colloquialism. I use it in the sense that Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff used in um, The Coddling of the American Mind. It's a great book which has documented and expounded upon similar events such as this at various places like the Evergreen State College and the Yale Halloween costume uh, fiasco with the Christakises. And um, a witch hunt is a psychological phenomenon where these things happen fast and they need to end fast and the effect is a great chill to whatever mob had formed almost instantaneously. So I knew it was on. I left Giancarlo's office and I was on my way back to my car and I heard some clarinet playing coming out of a dressing room. And I was, I assumed it was Catherine or Dan, one of the other clarinet players from the symphony, because it sounded so good. But as I approached the door, this is dressing room A, it's right by like stage left where the, um, I gave an interview with Tim, the engineer, um, for my Frank to Kelly recording in this room where this was happening. Um, it's right by the elevator and I just heard some beautiful playing, but I didn't recognize it. Like on the other side of the door, I was like, that's not Catherine or Dan, but who is this person? So I just peeked in and it was a jury for a Celerando. So inside were 
Kimberly McElmore, who is the, or was at the time, the Director of Education and Community Engagement, and the head of the EDIB Committee, the Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging Committee. So she is the um, lord over the family concert. I mean, excuse me, not the family concert. Lord over a cello rondo. And the family concert, too, for that matter. But the Acella Rondo program is under her stewardship. So I see her, Kimberly. I see Emily Boland, who's a clarinet player here in town that I went to USC with. She plays with the orchestra and sessions all the time. And the student, who I'd never seen before. And I could immediately tell it was a jury, and I said, oh, sorry. And I left. Because I felt bad for interrupting. And then the student um, came out into the hall and said she wanted to talk to me. And I said, sure, but um, let's not do this um, out here. Let's go back into the jury. Because, you know, the student is female and a minor. So it's just for my own protection, I'd like to have some supervision in the situation. So this young lady has requested to have her name left out of this, so I'm going to honor that request, and I'm going to change the name. So what I'm going to do from this point on, I'm going to read Kimberly McElmore's email recounting of this event. And I'm going to debunk it accordingly. So, this is sent on the following morning, February 21st, at 10.18 a.m. to Nikisha Hicks, who just resigned from her post as the director of HR and the head of the DEI machine. She left her job today. This email from Kimberly is to Nikisha and Steve Brosvick. He was the chief operating officer of the Nashville Symphony at the time. And he is now the CEO of the Utah Symphony. And previous to his time in the Nashville Symphony was the general manager of the Houston Symphony. For those who have known what I'm all about on the internet, holding people to the fire when they need it, I held some feet to the fire in Houston in 2013 and really blew the place up, and Steve was there. We've had some conversations about that and how that changed their audition culture for the good. It was a wake-up call to them. And Steve knew I would not hesitate to blow the Nashville Symphony story out of the water if I needed to. Because I wasn't making a threat. I was making a statement like, I will do this. If you, I mean, that is the alternative to firing me. Like, you, fi- you keep me? No, that's, that's not how I meant to phrase that. Excuse me. Back up. You either keep me or you fire me and get this thing blown out there. So, they didn't want to fire me. I, and I did not want to leave. So. So that's who this email is to. The morning after the event I'm about to describe. Subject, 22020 Student Jury Interaction. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to relay the interaction with James Zimmerman last night while Emily Boland and I were hearing an Acelerando student, parenthesis, Angela, close parenthesis, jury at the hall prior to the concert, parenthesis. Her jury started at 5.30 p.m., close parenthesis. Angela is the name I'm choosing to name this person. We heard Angela's jury in dressing room A next to the stage and she was in the middle of her piece when James knocked on the door. He asked if he could come in, parenthesis, he was not around when we went in the room, so I'm assuming he didn't know who was in the dressing room, close parenthesis. Yeah, that's true. I did not know who was in there and I was not in the halls when Angela went into her jury. I was in Giancarlo's office shouting him down for being inactive. 
Continuing. So I pop my head in. Kimberly says yes, and he popped his head in. He looked at Angela and said, Who are you? I answered for her in order to intercept the conversation. This is Angela. She is one of our Accelerando students, and she is in the middle of playing her semester jury. James apologized for interrupting and proceeded to tell Angela that she sounded great as he was walking by, and then he left the room. So that middle statement about me asking this person who it was and her intercepting the conversation is total fucking bullshit. Didn't happen. I walked into the room. I saw that it was a jury, and I left. This thing that she made up in the middle did not happen. So Angela comes out into the hall and gets me, and we go back, as I told you before. So here's how Kimberly tells us about that. Angela asked who that was, and Emily and I told her it was James Zimmerman, Principal Clarinet. She was starstruck and said she has always wanted to meet him. I told her she could go out into the hall and say hello if she would like to, now that she knew who he was. She left the room, and James and Angela almost immediately came back into the dressing room. That's all totally true, and I have no reason to disbelieve that that conversation happened in the room that Angela was like, um, who was that? Because <laughs> what else would she say? Like, who the hell barges into a jury? So I felt terrible, but Angela wanted to talk to me, and I could tell that she was starstruck because when you're the principal clarinet of the orchestra that, this, that administers the program, you know, you know who the principal clarinet is. Just like when I was um, 14, I knew who the principal clarinet of the New Jersey Symphony was. And when I was in Los Angeles, I knew who the principal clarinet of Los Angeles Philharmonic was. I mean, that's like the quarterback of your home team. So like meeting that person as a high school student could be um, a little bit exciting for a player in this situation. And I could tell that right away. So, and I did not, I figured this is already like a pretty high stress situation because this is a jury. You know, she's getting her final grade. She has to do this thing to participate in a cello rondo. So like, I wasn't going to ask to um, sit in and listen to it. I just tried to leave. I just tried to walk away. But she came and got me. I didn't want to be rude, so I went into the room. And um, so, yeah, all that Kimberly just said was true. She left the room, and James and Angela almost immediately came back into the dressing room. James said he didn't feel comfortable talking with a student alone and that he would feel more comfortable speaking with her in front of us. True. He looked at Angela and asked her name again. No, not again. I asked her for her name. She answered, and James replied, Angela, how do you spell that? Her name was a name that would not have been easy, easy to spell upon hearing it, so I really wanted to remember it, so I asked her how to spell it. I do this all the time when I'm learning new names for the first time. Um, she answered. James asked, how old are you? She answered that she was 14 years old. I don't remember that, but that's a totally normal question. What's your name? How old are you? He then said to her, Well, I am one of the best clarinetists in the world, and I stopped to hear your playing. It sounded great. Like, what the fuck, Kimberly? That's not what I meant. And I, you probably know it, but here's what I meant. First of all, you left out a key question. I asked a student for her last name, because I wanted to remember it. And she told me, and the name was not easy to associate with any specific nationality. Um, and this player had non-white skin. Now, I'm colorblind. I'm red-green colorblind. This means I cannot tell the difference easily in skin tone between, you know, what we would call black and brown in the modern discourse. It's just not reliable for me to sense that. So sometimes I ask for other details, especially if I'm talking to somebody who I want to remember. And... I really wanted to remember what was going on in this moment because I knew I was being witch hunted out of the symphony. So I better get my facts straight because everything I do and say, following the moment when I walk out of my boss's office is gonna be scrutinized deeply. So I wanted to remember the student's last name and I said, what's your nationality? And she said, I'm African American and she started to cry. So she starts crying, and I didn't know what to say. I didn't know why she was crying. She was just asked some very typical questions of someone who was impressed by her playing. So what I said was not that I was the, one of the best clarinetists in the world, but she's like, I was like, I know you might think I'm a big deal. 
I might have even said... This is what I said. I said, I'm a big deal. Something... It's impossible for me to remember. I mean, but the point I was making is, I'm a big deal, but you shouldn't be intimidated by me. Like, I'm here to hear you right now. Your beautiful playing lured me into this room. And it's gorgeous. So let's continue on with Kimberly's email. Kimberly said, I again inserted myself into the conversation, saying, yes, our Acelerando students are doing great work. Well, good for you, Kimberly, inserting yourself, protecting her from this racist monster that has barged into her room. Like, really good job. It's really cool that you, like, created this club and put yourself at the head of it so that you can decide who belongs in the symphony. Like, great job, like, hijacking the diversity bureaucracy and deflecting the attention from the horrors of your program onto the least the person who least deserves this bullshit from you and the orchestra for all I've done so really good job inserting yourself into the conversation I hope you're having as much fun doing this as I am James then asked who her teacher was even with Emily Bowen sitting in the room with us yeah I didn't know so, like, is that supposed to be an affront to Emily Boland? I said, who's your teacher? Like, I, I didn't know why Emily was there. The symphony hires people to do a cello rondo work when the symphony players can't do it all the time. For juries or master classes, they bring guests in, so it's not an, an obvious question. She's trying to say that I was disrespecting Emily or that I didn't know what was going on. I really didn't know what was going on. And I was trying to stop the black girl in the room from crying and calm her down. Because this is not the situation I wanted to be in at this moment. I gestured that Emily was her instructor. He went on to talk about how he and Emily knew each other and how they met in school. He talked about his teaching load at Vanderbilt this semester and his workload here at the symphony before looking at me and saying he knew I had asked several times for him to teach guest lessons or master classes with the cello rondo, but that he was incredibly too busy. Incredibly too busy. Nice. No, what? The point, again, that I was making so blatantly obviously that you would have to be fucking crazy not to understand it. I would love to be your teacher. And um, I would love to be working with you. But I'm the principal clarinetist of this orchestra. I've got 12 full-time students in a master class at Vanderbilt. And I, have been in, I will be in a recording studio for 15 hours this week recording for Disney and I also have I didn't say any of these things but I got like a life outside of that that I'm trying to live and if I had enough hours in the day I would love to teach Angela but I just don't have time I wish I did so after Kimberly says I was incredibly too busy I mentioned that he also had a family, and I understood his decision not to teach in the program. He then gestured to me and said to Angela, I want to say this in front of my supervisor. I am not sure why he said this. It was likely a mistake. I know I have a tendency to rub people of color in the orchestra the wrong way, and I just want this to show that it had nothing to do with the person playing, but that it was all about your sound. I stopped in the hallway to hear your playing before I even saw you. So she's trying to make me sound... Um, like really abrasive and clueless and threatening and intimidating and all these things. But, you know, there's a black girl crying in front of me. Like, why does Kimberly not mention that? Like, why didn't she mention that? That is the most important detail. That changes the complexion of the entire conversation. When a man being witch hunted out of his job for supposedly being racist, even though he has resurrected the dead career of the only black guy in the orchestra, there's a black girl crying in front of him because she's starstruck. Why is that not in this story? Wouldn't you think that's important? Don't you remember that? Like, how dumb are your memories? Like, this is what happens when zombie propaganda um, promulgates every conversation that is had in the orchestra. When you filter everything through this lens, you can't see anything. You can't hear anything. Everything is distorted. So why is that not in there? Well, now it's in there. So I said in front of my supervisor to go on the record. I said, you know what? I'm glad I'm saying this in front of you. I've had a tendency to 
rub people of color in the orchestra the wrong way. Angela was going to learn this someday, and... I guess here that is. And I was making the point, like, what color her skin was doesn't fucking matter. She played beautifully. She was anonymous. She was behind a door. This is why we have auditions behind doors. So that if someone's playing compels you, you don't get to know how old they are, or what they look like, or where they went to school. You just get to know some part of them, that vibration that's going through your ears, and then it's gone. And Angela's sound went into my ears, and it was gone. And it was beautiful, and I just didn't want to let it go, because I knew it was going down. So, um, what she says next, Kimberly, none of us responded to this. He proceeded to tell Angela she was in good hands with Emily and to keep up the good work. We all said goodbyes, and he left the room. That's more or less accurate. Like, I reassured her, like, I'm so glad you're studying with Emily. And I'm sorry to interrupt. Bye. Have a great day. I think what bothered me most, this is Kimberly's words, I think what bothered me most about the interaction was that he brought up a culture issues and or interactions with other symphony musicians with a student present. Real talk is what students need, not the bullshit that they're getting in a cello rondo now. They need real talk from real people who know how to listen to them from people who are literally colorblind and who grew up in a place that wasn't the South. They need people who know how to teach black kids. They need somebody who studied with a black man for three years in high school. When I was 14, I was studying with a black man. And guess what? It didn't fucking matter. When I was a professional tap dancer, the founder of the New Jersey Tap Ensemble, she was black, married to some white guy who was behind her every step of the way. All the best dancers were black. I had a black boss at Old Navy. I know how to talk to these people. I grew up I grew up four houses down from somebody that went on to play for the Philadelphia Eagles. I mean, what bothered you the most is that I brought up a culture issue. The whole fucking program is about cultural issues. Like, what clown world are you guys living in? You can't even make a compliment without, like, bashing Emily Boland. Is if I haven't shoveled tons of work in studios and the symphony straight to Emily for 12 fucking years. Like, I disrespected her by saying to Angela, like, you're in great hands. So... This comment was oddly received by Angela, and she asked James what James meant after he left the room. I just suggested we continue with the jury. I am happy to speak to this further if needed. No, nobody wants to hear anymore, but she went and read, um, she went and sent another email the next morning. Actually, no, 15 minutes later, she writes more. So she's like sitting there waiting, waiting. It's 1018 when she sent this. 15 minutes go by. I'm at the session. I have texted Steve Brosvik at 10.09 that morning. and he, he actually called me at 10.09. I said, I'm in a session. I can call you at 10.50. So they're all waiting. Waiting to see what I'm going to do next or waiting to see how to deal. And I was like, playing the session. So Kimberly says, as a follow-up, and I'm not sure it matters or is important to this at all, but James's speech was very disjunct, and it took him a while to finish a thought or statement though throughout his interactions last night. It could be nothing, but I have had several other conversations with James, and it hadn't ever been that disjunct. Yeah, the other times you talked to me, like when you used to let my wife and kids into family concerts, there was no witch hunt going on and no black girl crying in front of us. So maybe I was being a little bit more cautious and saying the right thing. Like, why did you not put that in there? So I left. I left the room. And I went back to the parking lot. It's like 5... She said that this was happening at 5.30. And I went back to my car. And I said, you know what? Maybe I should just go home. Maybe I should leave. Like, maybe this is it for me. Like, maybe that's the best... What, that's the last clarinet playing I ever want to hear in the skirmer horns. 
Skirmerhorn is Angelus. That's a good way to go out. But I didn't. I sat in my car, and I realized I had a job to do. And also that there was a witch hunt going on. And I went out like a fucking hero. Peak Eroica. So I walked back to the Skirmerhorn, actually ran back. And I still hadn't heard anything from management. Like, are we meeting with Titus and Amelia? Like, are we going to do the sit-down before the concert? After the concert? Like, when is this happening? Not, is this happening? Like, when is this happening? Like, we've got some people with some real struggles going on. Like, Kimberly Macklemore and Titus Underwood and Emilio Carlo. And I've been bearing the brunt of all of Titus's frustration and confusion and hatred while carrying him through every concert for almost three years. For which he never did anything other than command my respect by shouting me down. And I had just had it because I can't even drive to work without being harassed. This is what actual harassment is. When you follow people around backstage, when you make accusations that they're stalkers and liars, when you have proven yourself to be the only non-liar in the building, like, he will take everything and just turn it upside down. And I knew it was happening. I'd been warning management that this was happening for, like, years. Like, why do you think I pulled that N-bomb stunt? We'll go into that another time. But that was a test, and I knew that this was going to happen, so... I was thinking we would have a collegial way of, um, you know, working through it. Every Titus should have had the job. Like, I wanted him to get the job, and I wanted everything to be fine. But um, what I did not want was to be followed around and accused of being a stalker. So it's like, let's let's calm down. Like, something bad's about to happen. So I get back to the Skirmerhorn. I haven't heard from anybody. First person I see when I walk in is Alan. Not Alan Valentine. Alan Woodard. He is the head of security. I've got an email from him here in my file. This came on Tuesday, February 25th, 2020 at 4.51 p.m. This is the night before I got fired. So this is a minute later. But here's what Alan says. Um, good evening. On Thursday, February 20th, 2020, while making my rounds through backstage, I encountered James as the musicians were coming through the stage door. James came up to me after almost knocking a fellow musician down, proceeded to ask me if I knew what was going on. I don't remember almost knocking a fellow musician down, but since everything else Alan says here is true, I'm willing to admit that maybe I ran past somebody quickly to try to get his attention before he walked away. Like, he was way at the top of the ramp when you come in on a stage door, like all the way up by the clock. So I was like, dude, do you know what's going on? Like it was a golden opportunity because the first person I saw when I walked in the building was him. So I was like focused on him. Maybe I mowed somebody down in the process. Not a big deal. And certainly nobody was hurt. Here's Alan again. After I said no, he continued to tell me that a stalking complaint was going to be filed against him on Friday morning. He continued to let me know he needed my support. He said on more than one occasion that he didn't want to get physical. I didn't want it to get physical. That is true. I did not want to get my ass kicked. If you've seen these dudes, way bigger than me. Now, I'm tough, and I think I could have taken one of them, but not both. And Titus's locker was adjacent to mine. He was really stuffed in the corner. Like, the locker room's gotten really crowded over the years, and... He was a temporary player, so he got, like, one of the shittiest lockers in the locker room. The one that was, like, right in the corner. Mine was, like, one away from the corner. I picked it when I first got the job. Because I was like, no one will ever want this corner one. So I'll, like, have a little bit of extra space. It's very tight up in there. So, like, I'm not going to put myself in that situation where I'm going to go get my ass kicked. Like, if I if I accidentally touch Titus's body while I'm grabbing something, like, that happens all the time. Dudes are bumping into each other. It's a locker room. You know? So... It's like, let's just let them change. This is what I'm telling Alan. Like, whatever this dispute is that is going on, like, it should remain non-physical in nature. There should not be a fight. Let us not have a fight. So, like, just watch my back. Alan Woodard is a dude I've known for 10 years. Like, every time I walk into the building, fist bump. He's like, what's up, Zim? 
I mean, he has taken care he has taken care of my family, like letting my kids in and out and my mother-in-law. And you know, he'll let her in a door so she can use the restroom that, you know, technically patrons aren't supposed to come in cuz he knows she's related to me. Like this guy really does his job. Super competent. He handles security for the family that owns the Titans. He moonlights a little bit, so he's a real deal. Continuing. He continued to let me know he needed my support. He said on more than one occasion that he didn't want to get physical. It really hit home to where this was headed when I mistakenly overheard the Acella Rondo student who just finished up her lesson apologized to her mom for saying she was black after James went into the dressing room when she was taking her lesson. So, if that's true, that there's an apology being given by Angela to her mom for telling me she was black, I don't know what to say about this. I don't think that's something you need to apologize for, like telling someone you're black. I don't think it's something that should make somebody cry. But evidently, Alan was really put out by that, so he documented it. On more than one occasion, he told me that he felt safe standing beside me until Titus and Amelia were out of the area. Fact. I also encountered James again at the end of the concert. He stated again that he didn't want to get physical and had in his mind that he, he was going to be jumped on in the locker room. Bingo. So that message got across. Like, it's a very serious chance I was going to get jumped. And why put myself through that? Like, I've suffered enough. I don't need to get jumped. He stood by me at the elevator lobby until Titus and everyone left the backstage area before he went in to change his clothes. Yep, that's what happened. Because the only people that would listen to me were the dudes on the street level. Like, I had to talk to Alan face to face and be like, dude, shit's going down. Like, watch my fucking back. So that's what happened regarding the Accelerando incident. Now, I don't think the message is helpful. I don't think the people in charge are doing this right at all. You know, it's a wonderful program. And it's the outgrowth of something we used to have in the symphony, which is called One Note, One Neighborhood. That was a partnership with the W.O. Smith Music School on 8th and Edge Hill, right across from the Scientology building. I used to teach there a lot when I first came to Nashville. And I would sit with kids who would tell me about their fathers in jail instead of teaching them to play Ode to Joy on the saxophone. You know, we'd work on reading, not notes, directions, like left hand, right hand. Because a lot of these kids really couldn't read. Some of them were, you know, seven, eight, nine. I would teach them in the summer, like when their parents um, had them enrolled in like summer lessons. I would teach throughout the year. I did recitals there. Just a, a really beautiful program, One Not One Neighborhood. That thing was annihilated in 2013 with the pay cut. And then the next program that was instated was a cello rondo. So it's very similar. And I did a little work with a cello rondo, but with the problem with the program for me personally was that when the cello rondo filed, fired up, I was living in Nolensville, which is like 22 miles from town. And you had to teach lessons at appointed times with them in the skirmerhorn, and they would usually let out at like 5 or 5.30 to accommodate the kids' school schedule. And the traffic to Nolensville at that time would take me an hour to get home. And like, I'm a session player, I have my own students, so it was just more than I could commit to. I like really wish that I had more hours in the day, but I simply do not. So I had to turn the Accelerando role over to one of the other clarinet players. So that's totally cool. I still would do coachings and stuff, like for the Curb Youth Orchestra, but Accelerando's new. Like, Accelerando has much more um, audacious goals of getting these kids into symphonies, and the kids get to go to concerts for free. None of them pay for any of this. And, um, you know... I just couldn't participate. But there's a student named Alia Hanif, 
she's soloing with the orchestra tonight. Right now. She's probably done. But I knew Alia when she was in um, a cello rondo. And Alia's from Murfreesboro, I think. She, I believe, if memory serves, was valedictorian of her high school. She goes to Northwestern. She went to BUTI, Boston University Tanglewood Institute, a couple times. Very good player. Um, I believe she's of Indian descent. She's non-white, and that's all that matters to get into Echel Rondo. It has nothing to do with class. It has everything to do with race. Alia Hanif, it would appear, has the resources for private lessons. But she was in the program because she's not white. And that is what this program is about, is about getting people into orchestras who are not white. It's very clear. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm stating a fact. That is the goal of this program. You can read about it on the Symphony website. So Alia was at BUTI when I was at BUTI, or was I when I was playing with the Boston Symphony. So like a couple times she um she came up to the stage after an open rehearsal or a concert, like with tons of her friends from BUTI and was like, I know this guy. Um and it was cool. We took pictures, we put them on Instagram. It was cool. Like she probably felt super cool. And she hooked up a couple of her students with lessons from me because she, I guess, had my contact information from Instagram or Facebook, maybe. So I met a couple really, really talented kids up there because of Alia, and it was cool. And then as soon as Titus started grandstanding on the internet, Alia blocked me. So presumably she cannot hear this or she will not hear this. And she's over 18. This is what a cello rondo will turn you into, is somebody like Alia Hanif. You get to come back and solo with the orchestra, but you're just like... I don't know what you are when you come out of a cello rondo. I don't like it, though. I don't like what I'm seeing. You know, I don't like um, being blocked by people who don't want to associate with somebody who's willing to speak up about what happened. I'm all for the conversation. I'm just not going to be pulled into the zombie propaganda. And everyone knows that now. Everyone knew that all along, but now everyone's about to find that out. So I have an idea about something I can do to fix this. Or at least an offer to make. Because I think I have put Angela in somewhat of an awkward position. And I'm sensitive to that, but here's the thing. Angela doesn't need a cello rondo. She doesn't need all that extra bullshit because she, I don't really think she cares about that stuff. Based on what I've heard in her sound and the limited amount that I know from a couple conversations over Instagram Messenger and just about like music, the, the stuff she has on her profile. She uses TikTok a lot. I don't use TikTok, but she cross posts and her Instagram is beautiful. It's interesting, it's fascinating, it's funny, it's bright, you know? It's like, it's brilliant. And I'm worried that Angela is gonna become Alia. And that just makes me sad. So here's what I wanna offer. I was, at the time, as Kimberly said, incredibly too busy to give you lessons. But now, I work at Salesforce. And at Salesforce, as a, one of the terms of my employment, I am to donate 56 hours of my time to volunteer efforts of my choosing. Um, this can be any variety of volunteer work. Um, it doesn't, it's not specified, but we give 1% of our time, our money, and our product away every year. And for a company that makes $22 billion a year, that's a lot of fucking money, 1% of that. So they are paying me to go out into my community and do whatever I want, as long as it's for free. So obviously the Nashville Symphony is not going to want um, any volunteers for their teaching programs. 
nor would I volunteer to waste my time for a dumpster fire like a Celerondo. I don't believe in what they're doing. And I've invested enough in the Nashville Symphony. I'm withdrawing that investment. What I would do is teach at W.O. Smith again. So, Angela, I'll give you lessons for free if you want them. I don't expect you to take me up on this, but let's get talking. You know where to find me. You don't have to quit a cello rondo. You could take lessons from me on an as-needed basis. If you need college recommendations, if you need um, content pieces, if you need anything at all that you think I could help with, now I am not incredibly too busy. I'm incredibly interested in finding worthwhile things to do with my volunteer time from Salesforce. And I can't think of a better thing to spend it on than you, Angela. So the offer stands. I respect your decision to stay neutral on this, but you can't. This ideology that carries with it enough force to launch a thousand purges, as the writer Wes Yang once put in a tweet, It's going to damage you. It's going to take all the light out of you. And I'm really terrified about that. That is a crime against the future. And you're not in good hands. You're in good hands with Emily. But um, you can't stay neutral. Actually, you can. Or you can speak out about this. I don't care. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect the offer. Um... Emily Boland could get on the record and set this straight. But I have nothing to offer Emily Boland anymore, so I doubt that will happen. This stuff is so dangerous. See, by, by going through what I went through, we learned a lot about how willing people are to pile on with things they know very well are not true, just to save themselves. That's why I stated yesterday that these dumb fucks in charge of the Nashville Symphony don't care about the Nashville Symphony enough to care to take responsibility for what they've done and walk away. Like they damn well know they should. Nobody takes them seriously. They don't even take themselves seriously. It's just all zombie propaganda. It's nothing but that. It's never been anything but that. And until those people are gone, programs like Coachella Ronda will never change. But, like my software architect at Salesforce says, you got to work with, with what's already there. It's a great program. And it's not like you should scrap it. You should take advantage of everything you can there. Just keep your brain clean. And come study with me if you want. Take a lesson here or there. Every time I give a lesson, I'll just report an hour. And you know what Salesforce will do. They're so serious about making sure I have enough time to do this, that I get 56 hours of paid time off, vacation, or volunteer time off, VTO we call it, to do this. So like, what I'll do is like, if you wanna have a lesson Thursday or something, like on a Thursday, let's say, as long as W.O. Smith has a room, I'll just leave work an hour early. And when I punch in my time card at the end of the week, that day it'll be seven hours of Salesforce and one hour of you. I would rather do that. Like, that would make me a better developer. That's why Salesforce has me do this stuff. So I'm going to make an effort to, to make um, use of my time really wisely because you never know how much more time you have. Um, and I think we're getting close to a time where people need to act and people need to speak. And that's what this is. It's me speaking out about that night. And I hope this concert is going well. They are playing um, a piece that was arranged by Wilson Ochoa, um, the former librarian of the Nashville Symphony. And um, he's now the librarian of the Boston Symphony. And he put together this suite, and that's going to be fun. I hope it's a good concert. I, but I know these musicians. They're not happy. Things aren't going well. And I feel sorry for them. I really do. So I would like to figure out a way to end this all peacefully. And 
I hope somebody steps in because there's more of this left to talk about. And it's going to happen. It is happening. And we'll see. We'll see where it goes. But right now, I think I'm good. I think I did what I set out to do here. Um, I have no plan after this except to get offline for a little bit. And uh, just think about what to do next. I got a lot of big stuff planned for the rest of this year in my life. And I don't want this to take up any more space inside me any longer. I'm going to end with a, a quote that somebody said to me today uh, at a session in the, um, in the hallway where nobody else could hear us. I'm not going to say who said this, and I can't remember if I'm quoting it exactly right, but he said, there's a part of all of us that wishes, no, there's a part of all of us that wishes we could do what you're doing now, but can't. So I'm doing this. Peace.